Stimulus talks, you've heard, have stalled because the president refuses to back a deal that includes billions in emergency funding for the Postal Service. So they want $3.5 billion for universal mail-in voting. And the bill's not going to happen because we can't give them the kind of ridiculous things that they want. The president keeps claiming without proof that voting by mail would lead to fraud. But chaos, it, it's on the horizon right now. The Postal Service has sent letters to 46 states warning that completed ballots may not be delivered on time. And NBC reported earlier Friday that the Postal Service is planning to remove up to 671 high-volume mail processing machines across the country. So, Yamish, what are you hearing on this front? Well, the president really has dug in here. Can we hear you, Mish? I don't think... Yamish, I apologize. We can't hear you. We'll get you back. Uh, Jonathan, uh, when you look at the mail-in yeah. voting issue, uh, yeah. how, how does this play? Are we going to look... Are we looking at an election that could stretch on for months in the courts? I don't know about months, Bob, but I certainly think that this election is bound to go, if it's not decisive on election night, bound to go for a few days after that because of uh, not just the sort of mail-in ballots that we're going to have in the COVID era, but just because more folks are voting early, are voting by mail, even putting COVID aside. So I think that is certainly a possibility. But look, I, if you listen to the president's comments on mail-in voting, uh, they're kind of all over the, the lot. Obviously, he is hyping the issue up. But at the same time, he says yesterday and today that he'd be willing to sign a COVID package that includes more money for the Postal Service if that is sent to him. So I, like a lot of things, it's not clear where he, he's actually coming down. A real fast point. This is a very important. Three of the Republican senators who are facing the most competitive races this fall, Dan Sullivan in Alaska, Steve Daines in Montana, and Susan Collins in Maine, are three of the biggest advocates for the Postal Service in the GOP caucus. Mm. I can assure you that Mitch McConnell is quite aware of their concerns about the Postal Service because they're all from large rural states. And so I believe that ultimately there's going to be something done financially for the Postal Service, if not because of the public pressure, at least in part because of the political pressure that McConnell is facing given those three senators who are up this fall in tough races and whose majority could hang in the balance there. But Mary, is that right in the it, sense that the Republicans so far have been pretty quiet? Jonathan's spot on. Of course, Republicans are anxious in some of these Senate races, but you don't hear a lot of opposition at this moment to the president. This, this, is, this issue is hot and it's only going to get hotter because the postal system is an absolute wreck. And we have one state who is saying that they're going to count mail-in ballots up to three days after the election. Another state saying, wait a minute, actually, we'll count for up to a week. We're having, um, you know, people will remember that the, um, you know, the, the top officials of the Postal Service are all Trump appointees. That's just the way it is. He has politicized the Postal Service. And that led, of course, to President Obama today, who's been pretty forceful about this. And he said, we have now an administration more interested in suppressing uh, the vote than the virus. I think people know it's a mess. It can be hacked. There's a problem with the machines. It's, it's kind of um, a sign of broken infrastructure. But wow, I mean, here we are celebrating next week, the 100th anniversary of when women got the right to vote. And we're talking about the fact that the United States of America can't ensure a secure vote. Trump, the leader of the country, should say, we're going to have a bipartisan commission to say we're going to have a safe election, a fair election. Instead, it's just confusion. It's like, hey, we're not going to, um, you know, we're not going to give you the money you need. Well, what about all the Social Security checks and other things that come in the mail that people need? You know, it's more sowing kind of confusion. And people are not even going to know what to trust. Am I allowed to mail it in? Am I allowed to drop it off? Exactly right. Um, you know, think of yeah. the, the havoc that Russia could, could wreak on this. Um, it is really going to be, I think, one of the biggest and most important issues going forward. Aisha, I'm glad uh, Mary brought up the... Jonathan, you want to jump in? Yeah, just real fast. Um, uh, speaking to Chris Coons, the senator from Delaware, earlier tonight, he told me he had a conference call today with some voters in his state in Delaware that the first and last uh, comments on the conference call were this. 
maybe we're going to have to vote in person now. So that's fascinating to me that this far out from the election, all these questions about the, the Postal Service could lead people, Democrats especially, to move from mail-in voting to voting in person because they want to ensure that, that their vote is counted. Starting to hear the first rumblings of that tonight. Aisha, why is the White House and the president backing away at this moment from a deal? We've heard the argument about the president's made about the Postal Service, but at this point, they're not really engaging with congressional leaders to try to finalize a deal. Is this a standoff that could last for weeks? And what's the consequence for Americans out there who may be counting on aid or more federal payments? Well, you have Congress out for a, a, a few weeks, so it looks like you could have that. And it seems like part of what the issue is right now is that you have another person at the table. You have a chief of staff, a, a President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, at the table, and he is not as mu as not as inclined to reach a deal as uh, Stephen Treasury Sec Secretary Stephen Mnuchin, who had been representing the administration. So what you're seeing is, you know, Meadows kind of bringing his Freedom Caucus days to the White House and and kind of more uh, obstruct or I don't want to say obstructing, but more uh, uh, putting up. Uh, barriers to a deal because or taking a harder stance than Mnuchin, who Democrats have said that they have an uh, easier time working with. So this is so that's what you're seeing right now. And I think that's what you're seeing is that kind of hardball happening right now. And it's really kind of a gamble. Well, for all for for Republicans and Democrats, because people are out there hurting and they're saying that they need help now and Congress is not acting. And we have the conventions next week. I mean, the Democrats start their virtual convention. It's a historic convention for many reasons. It's all virtual because of the pandemic. Uh, Mary, what are you looking at as this all begins? I mean, who needs the conventions more? Trump, according to all the polls, he needs a blast. You know, uh, Joe Biden just got one from his choice for VP, which would be historic. Um, and so he has the most to lose and the most to win. So I think that you're going to see um, some powerful speeches uh, next week. The line, the Democratic lineup is strong. And you can bet that Trump, the showman, is going to be thinking about what he's going to do because energy is what he needs. And he's the one who needs. And he's going to deliver his speech bounce. from the White House. He's, he's said he's going to talk from the White House during the convention week for the GOP. And maybe there'll be flyovers. He loves flyovers. We'll see. But he's got to have some razzle-dazzle because he needs the bounce. Jonathan, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, obviously when you're trailing in the polls, the onus is on you to deliver. And I think uh, for, for Biden, it's more meet expectations, portray yourself as a, as a solid, stable or alternative to the president for, for Kamala Harris, make a, a good first impression for a lot of voters who are going to be seeing her for the first time. And I think Mary's right. I think the following week there is more pressure on President Trump. How do you revive your campaign? How do you make a fresh case to voters? And most importantly, how do you convince them that Biden is not a, a safe and stable alternative and that they'd be better off sticking with four more years of you than going back to the Democrats? I think that is the case that he has not yet made, Bob, is why they should not pick Biden. They've had four or five different messages on that. they got to figure out one strong case as to why voters should not be for Joe Biden. I haven't heard it yet. Jonathan, real quick, you've been covering this Democratic race for over a year. What's the one speech yeah. you're looking at next week? Oh, well, I, I, th I think it's, it's Joe Biden. And, you know, uh, what is his case for why he's going to be able to get this country out of a ditch? I mean, this is an historic moment in American life, the combination of a devastating economic recession, an ongoing global health there. scare. And so I think that is it. Is why can Joe Biden, at almost 78 years old, uh, help get this country back on track?